welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast with Borg, Betts, and a baller. Welcome in. It's Wednesday, July 12th. Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Borgannoni, and I'm joined by Matthew Betts, Jason Moore, in the heat, the heat of the summer. The heat of the summer is understating it, Kyle. We have a 10-day forecast that never once goes below 110 degrees and on some reporting is up to 122 degrees, an average over the next 10 days of, I believe, 115 degrees average. For that long, I will be sleeping in my pool. It is a nightmare, and I am sweaty in air conditioning. That sounds fun. might be the last words we hear of Jason Moore. He might cease to exist after this short season. Like, this could be it. This could be the last episode. I live in the wrong place, man. I mean, you know, my family and I, we just took a vacation to Alaska uh, a month ago or so. And that was that's where my people live. That's that's where the Sasquatches are. We can be out in t-shirts and shorts in the freezing, beautiful weather. Why in the world I live in Arizona is beyond me. It's it's funny because you know I lived there for a little while, but Jason, you the entire time that I've known you have bemoaned living there. That if if this podcast didn't exist, if you didn't get to do it around your friends, there's no way that you would be living in Arizona. Uh, you know, it's probably more the grandparents and the family and all that nonsense. Um, but yeah, if if it was my choice, I'd be in San Diego right now. And that's that's where I want to call home. Best bets. You want to talk about the East Coast life right now? East Coast life is where it's at for you and I. Um, I was in Vermont, currently in Pennsylvania. My wife and I just moved this summer. And what's funny about Jason mentioning that and I, I had this like moment of like, yeah, it has been pretty hot. Yeah, it's been pretty humid. And then I was like, wait, it's like 85 to 90 here. So I have zero room to complain when you reference 120 degrees. I mean, you literally can't go outside. Like that doesn't sound no, fun you, to me. So that's not summer you, in my book. You just straight up melt. You uh, like you can. It's not even a joke. All uh, just in seriousness. When you walk to your car, let's say you're at a grocery store. You just go from the grocery store to your car, which you probably left running. You feel your skin burning. You actually feel it like, oh, I shouldn't be on this place on the planet right now. Yeah, humans were not meant to exist very long in that spot. Uh, Hopefully you're surviving the summer wherever you're at. Last week we talked about our top 10 dynasty wide receiver ranks. We counted down one through 10. I did a terrible job with the counter. And so I'm going to scrap that this week. We're not going to, we're not going to go through that. We are, however, going to look beyond the top 10. And I think that's where a lot of people have question marks of, Hey, what do I do beyond the studs? How do I assess that? So we're going to talk about specific players that we find beyond the top 10. Interesting. If you want to get all of our ranks, they are there in the ultimate draft kit. Plus Jason's startup ranks, which we will be referring to on this episode, his dynasty rankings, where he's, you know, hot and bothered by certain players. And in some of these questions, I mean, Betts and I, you know, our job is to kind of fill out a lot of stats, a lot of stuff in the UDK. But Jason, I almost knew what your answer was going to be on some of these players before we even started. Yeah, it, it is funny. I went to put in answers to the questions that we're posing today. And there was at least one of them where my answer was already in there. <laughs> you you know me very well. So we'll be talking about all of those today, but if you want to get all those rankings and up to date, uh, you can go to ultimatedraftkit.com. Let's talk about those ranks. Dynasty rankings. We're going to start debuting some new drops, by the way, because our boy Mike finally got around to some dynasty related drops that are uh, they're pretty good. And we even got some for DFS. So new drops is, is always a, a good thing. But last week, Jason, I want to get your opinion on those top 10 wide receivers. We went through the rankings, and last week we talked back and forth about Jefferson and Chase. We even kind of landed where it's totally okay for Chase to be the 101, and I think I talked Betts into it. Did did you feel that way, Betts? 
Yeah, we talked, and then you kind of gave a couple points, and I started talking as if I was going to go the other way, and then in talking about it, kind of convinced myself. So, so I think I landed there. And what's hilarious that you bring that up is uh, I was just listening to this incredible podcast called The Fantasy Footballers uh, yesterday, and Big Shim was talking about are we just are we silly for not having Jamar Chase at the one point oh one? The writing is on the wall that a massive year is coming and you could see just this huge leap forward. So I think the conversation in redraft is interesting, let alone in dynasty. Yeah, it, I, that's funny. I, I apologize. I've been extremely busy. I've not listened to last week's dynasty episode, which I'm sure was amazing. So that's so interesting to find out that I had similar, totally unrelated thoughts to that because, and, and obviously this was more for redraft, but the, the arrow is we hope just horizontal for Justin Jefferson, right? Just keep doing what you did. That is enough. The arrow is not pointing up for him. That would be borderline impossible. Whereas the arrow for Jamar Chase can absolutely still be pointing up. I mean, the, he's got a lot of opportunity to run more routes, catch more passes, and have this offense become more and more and more of Joe Burrows. And then you add in the future. You know, who who is Justin Jefferson's quarterback two years from now? I promise you nobody knows. You can't get that question right right now. So the rest of our top 10 rankings after we talked about Jefferson Chase was A.J. Brown, Garrett Wilson, CeeDee Lamb, Jalen Waddell, some guy named Amon Ross St. Brown, Chris Olave, Tyreek Kill, T. Higgins. And a quick question I just want to give, is there any tear break that you see there, Jason, in those wide receivers 3 through 10 that you're like, hey, you know, I, I kind of see... It's a little different. We're taking the consensus rankings, but I wanted to get your quick thoughts on those players before we talk about those today. So any any tier breaks from three to ten? Yeah, I think so. I think when you the 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 super young guys, Olave, Amon Ra, Jalen Waddle, Ceedee Lamb, Garrett Wilson, that those those guys, there's a tier break to me between having one of them and Tyree Kill, who I think Tyree Kill has three more excellent seasons, and the next two seasons are probably better and more valuable for fantasy than any of those guys above them, right? But still, in a dynasty, if you're talking startup rankings and who I'd rather have going forward in a league, I, I, you know, I, I think there is a gap uh, that, that you would rather have the the age and the amount of years left with those other players. So I would, I would put that next tier cutoff around player eight. So at the end of the episode, we kind of talked about players that could fall from the top ten. And I wanted to start the discussion today, not you know counting down 11 through whatever, but more asking the question of who could jump into that group next year. Who could jump into that top 10? Because if you just look at dynasty values, it's not going to be as clear as possible where you say, hey, you know, DJ Moore, for instance, in year three was seen as a top five dynasty wide receiver and then kind of hung around 15 18, 19, it's kind of where DJ Moore lands. So it's really hard to sustain that type of value in Dynasty League. So, Betts, I will start with you first. Who is your favorite candidate outside of the top 10 that we talked about to land there next year? Yeah, we're going to be talking a lot about Seattle today and their wide receivers. And the name I'm going to bring to the table is the rookie Jackson Smith and Jigba, which when you think about a player who is going to be ranked potentially as a top 10 Dynasty wide receiver, Almost always, they are guys that hit in year one, guys that are young, obviously, and have that first-round draft capital, which Jackson Smith and Jigba does. He's currently in our startup ranks wide receiver 17. Jason's got him wide receiver 15, so he doesn't have to go that far to get there. And I think when you look at his college production profile, which was incredibly elite uh, breakout age, super young production, playing next to current NFL superstars that we just talked about last week, Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson, what he did with those guys on the field tells you how good he can be. And I think going into it, we all talked about it. He's our wide receiver one. Let's see where he goes. Let's see the draft capital. And he checked the boxes as far as that's concerned. I know there's some pause, maybe hesitation and redraft. Like he might be slot only. He might not be the dude this year. But I think when you, when you look at the end of the year and he, if he does anything, that's just good enough. If he posts like wide receiver, three numbers, back end wide receiver, two numbers, something like that, especially in the second half of the year, Dynasty managers are getting way smarter to be like, hey, that's what I want to look for in a potential superstar. And obviously, the age is a big factor. And we talked about last week, there's some guys that are still above him in the ranks that this time next year, they're going to be lower than they are right now. 
Tyreek Hill is 29.4 years old. Next year, he'll be 30. Next year, Steph Diggs is going to be 30. Devontae Adams will be 31 years old. And I think when you look at just that kind of group of elite wide receivers that are going to be entering that phase of their career, it's not hard to talk yourself into, hey, let's bump up these you know year two guys up a little higher. One of those guys could certainly be JSN with Seattle. Part of my trajectory, as I look at other players that we looked at in Dynasty and say, okay, maybe they'll have a similar path. So it's hard for me to see him in year one just blow the doors off with the competition there, but I feel like he could take a similar trajectory that we saw in Devonta Smith, where rookie year was good, I wouldn't call it great, and now you're looking at him as a borderline top 10 guy, you know, in second year he was a wide receiver one. So I think that's kind of more the tra- trajectory I'm thinking than somebody who takes a Justin Jefferson leap in year one. But like, you've got to be happy with that if you took him at the 102 in one quarterback leagues, 103 in Superflex, wherever. Like, you would be really happy a year from now if he's, you know, top 15. And I think top 10 is certainly on the table. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm with you. I'm, I'm going to hop in here because my, my player that I had put in before Betts uh, picked JSN was his teammate across the field in DK Metcalf because I I think it's pretty easy to assume, oh, who's going to jump into the top 10? You look at those top 10 that we currently have, it's mostly really young players because that's what dynasty managers get thirsty for. But I wanted to give some credit to DK Metcalf. Um, so far this offseason with some redraft talk, um, I don't know that we have been high enough on DK Metcalf. And when I look at him, He's still only 25 years old. He has many years of prime football left uh, for wide receivers, usually peaking around age 27. I think we forget how young DK Metcalf is because he looks like he's had 40 years to grow into the body that he owns. Um, if, If he comes out this year and has that positive touchdown regression that he should have, puts up double-digit touchdowns again like he did the previous two seasons. I do think that, I mean, Tyler Lockett's going to play this year at, what, 32 years old? Uh, I believe he is, um, he's an elder statesman. And he will almost for sure still be on the roster next year because I believe they would incur a $19 million dead cap for 2024. Um, but But he will start to get phased out. And I love Tyler Lockett. I've been a Lockett lover forever. But, he, you know, at, at the end of the season, you're going to be going into age 33 where your contract is about to be a problem for the roster and they're going to be looking on how to move forward without him. And I think both JSN and DK Metcalf have a lot of value going forward for fantasy. Now, the I, I would say the downside here, the downside here is just was it a Geno Smith outlier season? That's the fear because – what we saw from Geno Smith seemed very replicatable. He didn't do anything crazy. He didn't have some insane 7% touchdown throwing. He didn't have crazy broken plays that made a statistical anomaly. I think what he did is who he is. So I'm projecting he just continues that going forward, and that's enough. I mean, you look at Justin Jefferson, he's got a Kirk Cousins, and he's fine. I think Geno Smith can play to... Um, about that level. So I, I like DK Metcalf and, and JSN moving forward. I think it will be more difficult for JSN to hop DK Metcalf next year just because you bring up, uh, Kyle, like rookie year Devonta Smith. He, he had a pretty good season, not outlandish or great, um, but he was like the wide receiver one for that team in his rookie year. JSN here this season, barring injuries uh, to Lockett or Metcalf, he will be the wide receiver three. He won't be on the field in two wide receiver sets. And this is a team that plays a lot of two wide receivers. You know, they're, they're not they're not up there in the 80% of three wide receiver sets. And I don't expect them to change just because they have JSN. I do love JSN's future, though. With DK, I w- Betts and I have been talking about a lot in best ball. It's just w- with touchdowns being so, you know, valuable in half point formats like there's just so much on the table. Andy's talked about this. You talked about this last week, Jason. And like 10 touchdowns feels on the table and not outlandish at all to start from there. Like he could lead the league in touchdowns this year, DK. And we could be talking about him as a, I don't know, top six or seven dynasty wide receiver next year. So I I agree with you. The, The sentiment I think over the summer has been, we love DK. 
oh, wait a second. I think we're still too low despite the fact we're talking about him all the time. So what's his ceiling this year? Like how high could he finish just this year in redraft, Jason, in your mind? I think you're talking about top five. Um, Whenever you've got a player who can put up 14 touchdowns, you know, that's that's absolutely um, in the realm of possibility. All right, I'll bring up one more player, and I want you guys just to to body me right now if you think I'm being a homer. Because when I entered this pick in here, Atlanta Falcon, Drake London, I was like, oh, no. People are going to think that I'm bringing him up just because he's a Falcon. And, Jason, do you remember my my reaction last year, like when they took Drake London? I was, like, okay with it, but I wasn't, like, ec- ecstatic. I think it was similar to your fandom when they drafted Bijan. You're like, it's fun. I like it. I'm not sure it's the right pick for franchise building. Yeah, and honestly, I would have loved Garrett Wilson at the time. Jameson Williams was a fun player. So I, I want to preface that by saying I'm not just bringing up a Falcon, but Drake London is almost 22 years old, people. like He is a baby. In fact, he'll turn 22 the day after my birthday. But Drake London in our dynasty startup rankings is that wide receiver 15. And my question is what would it take for him to enter the top 10? Because we know what he did as a rookie and we saw his target share is the highest for any rookie wide receiver since 2014, but target share can be deceiving, right? 29% of Marcus Mariota uh, and Desmond Ritter targets are not really as cool as 25% of Mahomes or, or Hertz. So what do you think Drake London has to do? I'm asking this question because I, I think enough's there in terms of the age, in terms of Drake London could easily catch six to eight touchdowns just based on size alone. He had 117 targets last year. I think it's not hard to see that again. So what does Drake London need to do to be top 10? Because he's kind of seen after Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave in that group, but I, I would put him talent-wise right there. Betts, what are your oh, thoughts? Talent- Ta- oh yeah, I mean, uh, talent-wise, I I certainly think uh, uh, that he is right there with those guys. If they had swapped teams, yes. uh, Drake London could e- easily be there. Um, the fact that you've got to compete with Mac Hollins and Scotty Miller and uh, Kadero Hodge, I mean, you, you, there's <laughs> the goats. There, I lo- they don't have a lot of passing there, but you don't need a ton of passing when you get all of it. I was gonna say too, like. If he just repeats what he did last year, again, the age thing, right? These, these guys that are ranked above him will come down. Naturally, he will move up. And I think there's some optimism that maybe Atlanta isn't, like the output isn't as bad from a volume perspective. They will still be very run heavy. But when you look at how terrible, and I mean, it was so bad for Marcus Mariota from taking sacks, throwing the ball away, design rush attempts. Desmond Ritter still has plenty of flaws, don't get me wrong, but when you look at the splits, and it's a small sample size, it was only, what, like four or five starts or something like that for Ritter, but in those games, they got off more plays, their attempts were up a little bit, so if you factor that in, even if the quality of quarterback play isn't great, it already was bad last year, and he showed us on a per route run basis. It, like Jason said, if he was with another team or another situation, he, we'd be talking about him, I think, like we do with Olave, like we do with Garrett Wilson, so uh, it's not hard to see Drake London having an okay to good year, but us still saying in Dynasty, look, he's so young. He could get a quarterback upgrade. You know, those sort of things are on the table for next year. So uh, I'm very much in on Drake London in Dynasty. It's it's one of those situations where I think in redraft, like I don't I don't know if I'm there yet, right, because of the, the concerns. But when we think long term, he's so young. The draft capital is there, and he's been pretty awesome on a per hour basis. Yeah, speaking of just youth in general, I was looking back at, Dynasty wide receiver ADP. You can have a wide receiver that has first round draft capital and doesn't smash the rookie year. Do you guys remember CD Lamb? It's like, it was good, not great. Second year, it was good, not great. And yet he was still ascending in value because the other guys were aging out and he was just so young. And then you got to see him in year three. So I'm not saying it's the same trajectory, but when you're dealing with a player that's that's drafted where he was and is about to turn 22 and if he sees another 120 plus targets, then he's just going to stay there and he's going to eventually just end up near the top 10. So uh, I just, I wonder how far he is though from Garrett Wilson and Olave in your mind. Like, is there two tiers between those two 
Or is it like next year we could be talking about them in the same tier? What do you think, Jason? Yeah, there, as of right now, there's there's a couple of tiers between them. Um, he, he had a very good season, but he wasn't elite. And, you know, sometimes you can excuse away a lot because of quarterback play. But, it, you know, it's not like it's not like Olave had, you know, the Mahomes. Um, you know, Olave didn't have great quarterback play uh, half the year. You didn't really have great quarterback play for um, Garrett Wilson. So I, I do think that we have to be honest and say that what those what those two guys showed on the field was better than Drake London. It's not saying that Drake London didn't show um, flashes of brilliance or that he sucked. I think he was good, but he wasn't as elite as those other two guys are as pretty much, you know, demanding targets and just being, um, you know, a, a more NFL ready wide receiver last year. Now, obviously, with the body type that Drake London is, he might have more of that transition period to the NFL when you've got a smaller, quicker, jitter, jitterier player um, that can run the the modern NFL routes like Olave or Garrett Wilson. Really, they're they're similar in that way. Um, you might have a quicker transition. So, yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm in on Drake London, but I do see a a, a tier or two difference. All right, transitioning from who could be in the top ten. Let's talk about some old farts, people. I want us to map out some veteran wide receivers that are in the mix that are helping dynasty managers right now, but who knows what they're going to be a year or two from now. So we're going to map that out, and Betts is going to give us his pick when we come right back. We'll get right back to the show, but want to remind everybody about the Ultimate Draft Kit and the Ultimate Draft Kit Plus, which includes... The Dynasty Pass, all of our information jam-packed to get you ready for anything involving Dynasty. We're talking trade targets, team opportunities, and the production profiles. We're in that time of year where there's going to be some rookies that start making some noise in training camp. And if you want to know, does this player have anything to offer other than just some hype? Go see what they did. How did they compare to other uh, to, to other pros out there who have already made it? I mean, guys like James Robinson, they start making noise, and you look at their production profile and you go, oh, yeah, that, that makes sense. Maybe I should pay attention to that. So head over right now, ultimatedraftkit.com. All right, we're back, and Betts is going to hit us with a player in Dynasty that is aging, but is he aged out just yet? I don't think he's aged out yet and when you look at redraft and best ball adp certainly people don't think so right cooper cup is currently a top five pick in both formats i've seen him go as early as 1.02 um you know 1.03 ahead of guys like mccaffrey sometimes ahead of chase like people are very very bullish on the outlook this year for cooper cup which i can't blame them right because when you look at uh where he was last year before the injury he was insane right we thought he couldn't do it again he did it again before the injury but it's a very difficult conversation because you know how good he is. You know how good the outlook is right now, but he's 30 years old. Next year at this time, we're talking about a player who's going to be 31, and I'm not sure the Rams are going to be the Rams, right? Because he signed through 2026, so he got the financial security, the contract, all of that. But Matthew Stafford was close to retiring this year with a serious uh, neck issue and the elbow injury from last year. Aaron Donald's talked about retiring for two or three years. They've got so many rookies on defense right now. They have no financial stability with, I think the team's kind of like, you know, the last dance approach of like, let's go for one more time. Let's see what we can do. And Sean McVay's hinted at like, I don't know, you know, how long he'll be there. So he's a guy that I love for redraft. The target share should just be outlandish. The red zone role should be crazy. So he could finish as the wide receiver one this year. And no would, would think twice about that. But he's a guy who I could see, the surroundings changing so much next year at just one year away from today that I feel like if you are a not a top four team, top five team in your league, like I'm trying to trade Cooper Cup away now before that stuff happens because of how valuable he is in redraft. Do you think that somebody who's who's competing and they're looking at, at your team and going, okay, I know that Cup can be a difference maker. I mean, no big deal. I just took him to Scott Fishbowl. But with Cup, you're saying I'm going to go all in, but the price for 
I don't know. What's the window? What's the window if you're a competing team? It feels like you're going to get at least two to three years. Like the, his skill set ages better in the NFL than I think some of these other big body wide receivers. So I'm fine with paying a first plus for Cooper Cup, knowing I'm going to get you know multiple years. I, uh, to, I am minimum. too. So I, I I get that. I get the fears. Right. You you can see a path for the Rams imploding. I find that the best indicator of long-term success or failure is on a on a franchise and on a, more specifically on a coaching level. Uh you know, you you trust really good coaches and you, you have to be proven that way and I I trust Sean McVay to figure it out. I think that their offense will improve and be better. They you know, it was like they were close to walking away but they didn't and the contract, um, who doggy? You know for sure that Cooper Cup is there the next two years. This year he would have a dead cap. You know it's it's so funny. Like Tyler Lockett got a bag, and Tyler Lockett's dead cap would be nineteen million dollars. That's a ton of money. They're never moving on from Tyler Lockett. Cooper Cup's dead cap this year would be fifty nine million dollars. Next year forty seven million dollars. He ain't going nowhere. Um, so you know you've got multiple years. I think the offense is going to be great. Obviously, it will end. It ends for everyone. And if you only get two years and you pay up, honestly, I think you're still happy. I really do. If if he's if he's two dominant years, it's probably worth it. If you get three, it's definitely worth it. Um, so I'm I'm not quite as bearish on Cooper Cup as you, Matthew Betts, but I guess, you know, it's good good to hear both sides because – so what would you be trying to trade him for? What do you think you could realistically uh, – you know, if you had Cooper Cup, what would you be realistically trying to trade him away for? I, I mean, I've if, got a couple offers that right, I'll throw out it, there. Kyle. And I, I want to assess you, Betts, because I think, I think we're close, but like I was saying earlier, a first, a future first, 2024, and Traylon Burks, which one would you rather have? Burks and just one first? Yes. Oh, I'm keeping Cooper Cup. We don't we don't know if Traylon Burks is going to be For sure. good in the NFL. Is it tempting, Jason? Yeah, that, I mean, that, I think that's a fair offer. That's the type of offer that you're going to need to give to get or give him. You know, it, uh, I could see I could see being on either side of that depending on your roster construction. Because obviously, when you're talking about Cooper Cup, what is your window? Are you a competing team that needs to win now? or that can win now, you've got a great roster and your window is open, then, yeah, trade a future asset, go get Cooper Cup, get a championship. Uh, alternatively, if you're like, man, my team is really old and I think I could maybe make the playoffs, but I'm not sure, that's when you kind of retool and you, yeah, you go try to get Jordan Addison plus or uh, Traylon Burks plus, uh, you know, and, and restock that way. That was the name that I want to throw out there. Would you do a first plus Jordan Addison? I think that's, I mean, it depends on your personal outlook on Addison. We are pretty high on him, especially given the opportunity is massive to just be a first-round rookie wide receiver who hits right away. So I think that's a pretty fair fair deal. I also thought, you know, in my head, like Jackson Smith and Jiggle, we just talked about him, him in a first for Cooper Cup, something like that. I think you need a first plus a very, very good young building block to move him. And I just want to say I'm not bearish on Cooper Cup. I, 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 I have taken Cooper Cup so much in best ball that – it scares me <laughs> to have Matthew that word Betts associated with me. Cup. But I just Betts think next year, Cup. when you look at this, 31 years, if you're not a contender, you have to move him now, is my opinion. Betts won't even, I don't know if you know this, he will only drink from glasses. He refuses to drink from cups. That's how much he hates Cooper Cup. Drinking out of a can right now, sir. Exactly. Exactly. A can is okay. A bottle <laughs> is okay. Just don't hand that man a cup. Um, well, look, if we're talking bearish, um, like we are clearly with bets on cup, <laughs> then I'll hop in next with my veteran and map out his future because I'm very bearish on Cortland Sutton, who is only 27 years old. Uh, you know that this is, this is a, this is prime age for a possibility for a wide receiver. If I had Cortland Sutton, here's what I would be doing. I would be waiting for the absolutely inevitable 100% guaranteed to come great report of how awesome he is in camp. 
I promise you, there will be a report that it might be the week after it's Judy or the week after it's Tim Patrick. Everyone's going to get a glowing report out of Denver this offseason with Sean Payton there, with Russell Wilson needing good vibes. Oh, Cortland Sutton's dominating. Oh, Cortland Sutton's establishing a great relationship. Oh, Cortland Sutton's been working off the field. Oh, Cortland Sutton's the locker room leader. of his life. Oh, for sure he is. <laughs> and when those reports start circulating and there is excitement and positivity around his name, that's when I'm looking to unload Cortland Sutton because here's what actually is his reality. This team tried to trade him. Uh, they absolutely tried to get rid of him and his contract. They have financial issues because of Russell Wilson. Um, and he's not that great. You know, this is he's going to come out this year and he's probably going to suck <laughs> compared to that contract. He's going to suck. And that contract, you know, it, it runs three more years this off season, but they can get out of it and save a lot of money. And so I think they're going to have to do that. So this is a player who, if he comes out and isn't great, doesn't dominate. I think he gets cut. If he gets cut, he goes and signs with another team as an older, big-name, really unsuccessful wide receiver, and he becomes the next Kenny Galladay. He will be absolutely worthless. And so, in my opinion, when there is positive news on Cortland Sutton, I think you can get something for him. His future for fantasy success, I would be surprised if it is relevant past this year at all. And this year, I think you're hoping for relevant. You're not hoping for... Great. You're not, you know, the Cortland Sutton breakout is not happening anymore. I think we've moved past that. You know, who has more fantasy points by the end of the year, Cortland Sutton or Tim Patrick? That's not a question that we should be asking for the money, for the draft capital, for the name recognition. But I, I think it's a legitimate question. It's, you know, it's probably Sutton still, but it's a question that's a fair one to ask. And you don't get anything for Tim Patrick and Dynasty. You could still get something for Cortland Sutton. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good way to put it. Is like we should not be asking that question. But then you also bring, you know, you bring up the other names in the depth chart. Like he couldn't do it last year. And, and granted, the whole situation was bad. But when you look at the per route run numbers between Jerry Judy and Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy was head and shoulders above Sutton from an efficiency standpoint. And then. Sean McVay says, we need Marvin Mims. Like, we have some holes elsewhere, but we need Marvin Mims. And I think that tells you a lot about how he feels about his wide receiver room. So I'm scared about Cortland Sutton's dynasty value, just if it hasn't already, falling off a cliff this year. And uh, Kyle and I put some money on under five and a half receiving touchdowns, Jason. So if you would like Ooh. to financially bet against Cortland Sutton, you can do that. He also has a receiving line of 725 and a half, which feels go get the under. so fragile, right? Like, his playing time feels fragile. Like you said, I think he does enter the season as the wide receiver two across from Judy, but how long does he keep it? Right. I don't, I don't even know. So yeah, the writings on the, on the wall, I think that there are very, very small outcomes where he becomes a guy that you can like start and rely on. But in dynasty, the age plus the volatility this year is a player that I've tried to move wherever I can. Well, the nice thing is the age plus the contract can be a selling point for him. He's only 27. That's not, you know, you're not trying to move a 30-year-old wide receiver. He's under contract for three more years. You you make sure that the other league mates know that. I mean, he's going to get cut after this year, I'm so sure. But he's technically under contract for three more years. That's the that's the positive spin. I'm sensing a lot of negativity about the Broncos. <laughs> Unlimited. And I get it. I get it. Uh so I, yeah, I'm with you guys, but you know, no big deal. I might have traded Sutton a couple years ago to Andy Schneider, and I'm just laughing around one of our programmers. So, yeah, got out early. Eat it, Schneider. <laughs> yeah, of course he's from, he's from Denver. So yeah, you, you, that's another pro tip. I mean, if you got a guy that's from a place or a diehard Packers fan or a diehard whatever fan, oh, you make him pay up. I want to give one more wide receiver that. Is hitting that age cliff, and I want to ask, how fast is it going to happen? So, Devontae Adams is 30.6 years old. In our startup rankings, I think we have him appropriately ranked wide receiver 16. Totally fine with that in Dynasty formats. He's under contract, technically, through 2026, his age 34 season, which is ridiculous. 
he signed a five-year deal entering his age 30 season where they gave him $65 million guaranteed to someone who's turning 30, okay? So here's my question for you guys. How often do 30-plus-year-old wide receivers sustain dynasty value? And is it normal? And I look back, and I look back at some players that at the time were seen as top 10 wide receivers in redraft. Okay, so Julio Jones, like his, he aged pretty well for a very long time, all the way up to age 30. He was still seen as a top 12 dynasty wide receiver. Okay. And then he hits the cliff at age 30. And then poor Julio Jones, Betts was telling me the other day, you, just, you look at his metrics and just how it fell off a cliff. Uh, same thing with AJ Green, DeAndre Hopkins, in terms of dynasty value, went from a top 10 guy at 29 to in the 40s. Devontae Adams, right now, Stephon Diggs, kind of in the same season. Right now, they're at a point where I think they're still worth something, and they're still worth something to a team for this year. Do I get one more year of elite production and then trade him? Or if I'm not a contender, would you guys say now is the time to trade a player like this? Yeah, I think you have to, all right? Because no matter, even if he's great this year, even if Devontae Adams, just like I was saying with Cooper Cup, if they finish as top five options, just because of their age, their value in the dynasty market will be less this time next year, no matter what. I mean, that just happens with age curves and how people rank for startups. Doesn't mean they're not valuable because if you're a contender, sure, yeah, Devontae Adams should be great. Cooper Cup should be incredible. You know, those are, are not questions in my opinion, but historically like it just happens right it doesn't matter how good these players are deandre hopkins a, a different situation obviously without a team but you know the guys you mentioned like they 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 just lose value so yeah i think if you're not a contender there's no reason to hold on Devonta adams right now you either trade him away now and and you know get young assets or you wait a couple weeks see if there's a contending team in your league that maybe loses a starting wide receiver or something like that and they're like my window is now i need a guy I'll go get Devontae Adams because my team's rebuilding. Um, that's a situation that makes sense to me, but I, I feel like you have to, especially there's so much fragility around the Raiders right now. Like I, I don't know where Devontae Adams plays football or who he plays with, right? Because he's already mentioned like he's not happy or, or has kind of hinted at that with the Jimmy G stuff. So uh, it seems scary, man. Yeah, the the I mean, you're right that if he's great and you get a haul for him, it's still worth it if you can get a haul for him. And you might not be able to in every league, but in some leagues you're going to be able to. My the the you know, a trade that I made that was invaluable for my success in our main dynasty league, I was able to pull off trading Julio Jones at his peak, in his prime. Here's what he had done. He was the wide receiver eight, the wide receiver two, the wide receiver six, the wide receiver five, the wide receiver five, the wide receiver three. He was just absolutely dominant in 2019. And then that next year, going into 2020, where he should still just continue his dominance, right? That was when he turned, uh, that was, you know, going from 30 to 31, where he had only been awesome up to that point. And going into 2020, I traded Julio Jones for C.D. Lamb and a first-round pick. I got really lucky because the next year, Julio Jones was dead. Uh, he was the wide receiver 53, 93, and 97. You know, I, I wasn't predicting that Julio was just going to fall off a cliff, but he did. If it lasted two years longer before that cliff fell and I still got C.D. Lamb and a first, I mean, that's insane. So... Um, you know, the, I guess it goes kind of back to the Cooper Cup discussions earlier, the Devontae Adams discussions. If you could get something like a Jordan Addison and a first or, you know, and, and I think in a lot of leagues you couldn't, right? And and it's always team and situationally uh, uh, dependent. And I will say this, every time we've done these shows and we talk about trade options and we throw out a trade like this and we say, hey, Go see if you've got Cooper Cup or you've got Devontae Adams. Go see if you can get Jordan Addison plus first. Oh, you go, nah, it can't happen in my league. No one would ever do that. And then we get like 200 messages of like, oh, thanks, man. I got that trade to go through. You just never know. Go check it out. People do make these deals. Um, I, I think it's right, though. When, when you get to this age range around these great wide receivers, we're not saying they'll be bad. 
But if you can capitalize for young stud plus a first, really hard to lose on that. You'd ha you'd have to have both of those players. Both options suck. C.D. Lamb would have had to suck, and I would have had to whiff on my first. You know, because you know that the clock is running out on you know the the thirty plus year old wide receivers. Yeah, every league. There's different contexts, and if you want some more info on that, we have a great article on the site called Dynasty Trade Secrets, 10 Tips for Successful Negotiations, because you have to tweak it. For instance, I know Jason has Devontae Adams in a Dynasty League that I'm against him, and he's about to age out, but your, your context is, I'm just going to keep riding him until the wheels fall off, where in another league, you might feel the pressure of, I need to trade him now, so it, it just it's so dependent on each league. 100% context matters. We're the three-time champions in that league. I remind you, champ, 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 back to back to back. So Devontae Adams ain't going nowhere. <laughs> I, I, we've got we've got Travis Kelsey, uh, Devontae Adams, and I, I I don't remember how many. Oh, Derrick Henry. It's like we're we're Mike about Evans. to expire. I mean, our 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 expiration date is like we are two weeks past on this gallon of milk. <laughs> but I'm gonna drink it till I, the day I die because we got to go for a fourth championship. This is just you know rules are rules. So yes, context matters in your leagues. That, so that's like your dynasty team's like diet is just that old chunky milk. Just old chunky milk, <laughs> building them bones strong. Uh, all right. Next category I want to talk about is a wild card. We did this on the main show, and I think in dynasty it's even harder because when people ask all the time about our rankings, I see questions all the time, and they see a player back to back in rankings, they're like, "Oh, well, you must like this player more." It's like, no, each player has a different range of outcomes and some of them feel so much safer. And so I want to talk about a player that's further down in our rankings, but could go anywhere this next year. And I'll let bets start. It was one of Jason's boys last year, Christian Watson. And I honestly have just stayed away because I don't know what to do with him. So bets, what are your thoughts on, on Watson? Yeah. He, to me, feels like the definition of a wild card because when I, when I think of that in my head, I think of a player that you can make an argument for or against and both sound pretty good. And so we don't really know where his value is going to go, but I think about the player and I think about kind of how we thought about him entering, you know, last year as a rookie, it was like, well, he came from a four year FCS school, not a ton of production, you know, then he dealt with a little bit of injury in the off season and kind of got off to a very, very slow start was basically irrelevant for fantasy for the first two thirds of the year and then just went absolutely bonkers down the stretch. And that sounds a lot like the archetype of what Amon Ross St. Brown did when he was a rookie, where it was like, this is not sustainable. His target per out run yards per out run stuff, his touchdown rate, like that is just not going to happen. But we love betting on year two wide receivers who are young. And so that all to me sounds kind of good. But at the same time, you look at the situation and you're like, well, you know, is Jordan Love good at football? We don't know. The Packers don't know. No one really knows. But at the same time, you look at the target competition and it is insanely weak. Like rookie tight ends, not just one, two rookie tight ends. And then guys like Romeo Dobbs, who is fine for like a fourth or fifth round NFL draft pick, but not necessarily a target earner. And then Jaden Reed, who we've talked about in the, you know, the pre-draft process and after the NFL draft, but there's been no buzz on him reportedly was just doing like you know returns and stuff in OTAs and minicamp so it's not difficult to see a 25 percent target share plus for Christian Watson the issue is it's just he was so unsustainably efficient last year that you're like where where is he and who is he as a player because a lot of his production came from touchdowns um so I, I feel stuck on him I want to be in on the archetype and the age but at the same time I just can't get that other stuff kind of out of my mind the rookies that did what he did in terms of that amount of touchdowns and that few receptions is the Gabe Davis, uh, Martavis Bryant, Anthony Miller, Jahan Dotson also did it, but it's like a wide ranging comp because you just can't predict that. But your note in here is kind of offensive to me, but I, I, I agree with it. <laughs> <laughs> you said the target competition is weaker than Kyle. Mm. Yeah, yeah, Kyle, you want to you speak to that or what? <laughs> You just didn't even throw out Aaron Jones. How dare you? Their wide receiver well, one on this team. I was yeah, you're That's right. He the is probably my, is the wide receiver one. I was talking more about the actual wide receivers on the depth chart. Kyle. Oh, Come on. I I'm with Christian, you. Christian Christian Watson has been a I mean, he's a perfect wild card player to mention because Christian Watson, nobody really knows what to believe. Um 
and I've I've been at that place through a lot of this off season where I've stayed away because you just don't know. You don't know if Jordan Love's good enough. You don't know if you know. I went back and watched every single target from Christian Watson this last year, and he had so many of these amazing plays that 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 were just great throws by Aaron Rodgers, hitting him right in the hands, in stride, over a defender where he could just run away. And you're like, eh, is Jordan Love going to be able to do that? Probably not. And in the end, I have come away, at least today, confident in my take. I think Christian Watson's going to be a great player. I actually think Christian Watson is a stud and will – have his athleticism and his dominance win out at the NFL level. This is a guy who was unheralded in college because he went to a smaller school. He didn't have a lot of production because this was a championship winning run the ball team. They didn't need him. They won the championship with him doing just what he did. You you don't need him to do more than that because their goal was to win a championship and they did. Then he goes to the senior bowl and at the Senior Bowl was the bell of the ball, the talk of the town. Everyone from the Senior Bowl said he's just dominating everyone. Then he goes to his rookie year, and he just dominates. When he's on the field, he had injuries and he wasn't on the field, but he just showed that specialness. And so I think I've gotten to the point where I'm betting on the talent. The talent of Christian Watson, I think, is legitimate, and so I'm in on him. But I obviously, he's a big range of outcome player. In fact looks like all three of us chose a rookie wide receiver from last year for our wild cards. Um, my wild cards, Traylon Burks. I mean, Traylon Burks could be dead after this season. I mean, he, he not just like, oh, Jeez, he could man. get a car accident. <laughs> I'm just, I'm over here murdering fools. This um, is the range of outcomes. <laughs> he could be incredible. We want to talk about, like, fl flaming out. Uh, he was doghoused last year. Couldn't get on the field, uh, constantly injured. And, uh, you know, this is a team led by Vrabel where it's like, if he gets doghoused again this year, you could have the wheels fall off of this entire team. You could have DeAndre Hopkins come in and just relegate him to a backup wide receiver. You could have Banana Rama come in for Ryan Tannehill and become the starting quarterback and have Traylon Burks be worthless. Alternatively... Uh, we just went through this division on the fantasy footballers, and two thirds of us actually picked Tennessee to win the division to be good because of Vrabel. If that happens, it's only happening because Traylon Burks is good. Everything he showed when he was on the field running routes was, yeah, he can hang. He's good. Every report has been he's super in shape. He's playing faster. He's the number one. He's the alpha. And if you want to talk about like target competition weaker than Kyle, I mean. The Titans dream of having Romeo Dobbs and Jaden Jalen Jaden Reed and two rookie tight ends to compete with Traylon Burks. They've got they've got like just Kyle left Phillips leftover fellow Kyle Cheeto crumbs to compete with. So his range of outcomes to me is is drastic. I'm betting on the success. I'm betting on that based upon my pre NFL draft belief in Traylon Burks. I was a believer then and I haven't seen anything to dissuade me I think where he's ranked right now we have him at wide receiver 26 in our startup is perfect to take a swing at a player that can immediately be a wide receiver two for your team the inverse of there's no co target competition is that maybe the passing offense is just bad and you look at some of those teams last year it's like well they didn't produce any high-end options but obviously I think after the catch he can do a lot of special things so He's a fun player. I want to throw out George Pickens because another player, who knows? Who knows what he is? No idea. And I dug up some stats, though. And tell me if if this is a little too Kyle. Just throw out some fun stats just to clown on other players. But did you know that George Pickens had the third most receptions of 20-plus air yards in the entire league last year? Did you know did not. that George Pickens had more top 24 weeks last year then Garrett Wilson and some guy named Amon Ross St. Brown. <laughs> Classic <laughs> Kyle. Cherry picking stats just to make his yeah. case. Of course. Go ahead. Keep going. My point in throwing it out there, and I also tweeted about it, was you're like you think of George Pickens as all or nothing big plays and zero consistency, but he for a rookie wasn't terrible with a terrible quarterback historically, right? 
So I just want to give him more credit than he's boomer bust and that's all he's ever going to be. Like he could easily improve upon that in this next year. You could see him as a locked in top 24 wide receiver. He's also really young, only 22 years old. And I looked at other players that were kind of drafted around him, you know, in the second round and their archetypes of what you could see in dynasty, like Christian Kirk, Michael Gallup, Hollywood Brown, these kind of big play guys, they've kind of hung around wide receiver 24, wide receiver 30 range. And I think if you got George Pickens, if this year he ends up being a dependable flex or a top 24 guy, that wouldn't shock me, but it feels like he's kind of being left in, oh, he's just going to flame out. But I think George Pickens isn't like that much less talent, talented than Christian Watson. I think his situation is really tough to bank on with Kenny Pickett, but would you guys say that George Pickens is just a talent tier below Christian Watson? I don't think you can answer that question yet, personally, on either okay. guy, because Christian Watson could come out and have a year where we're like, oh, what a silly conversation on the Dynasty podcast. He is that dude. you know. But George Pickens, like, it, it, seems, it seems less likely to me that he has that sort of season where we look back and we're like, wow, man, like he is that good because it's a big parlay to cash. Like he has to take targets from Deontay Johnson. Pat Fryermuth is there and Christian Watson has, like we said, no target competition and Kenny Pickett also has to take a step forward, a massive step forward to support those three guys. So it's, it's not one that I don't think is out of the possibility. I just think it's a bigger, you know, like I said, parlay to cash for those things all to come to fruition. So if I was making the bet, I'd make the bet on Christian Watson making the leap over Pickens. Doesn't mean Pickens is a bad player or just not capable of anything like that. I just think it's less likely. Yeah, I think I agree with with bets. I would certainly bet on Watson over Pickens. I'm I'm a little bit more bearish on Pickens. I appreciate what you're saying that you know he played with a bad rookie quarterback and he was still pretty good. Had his moments, certainly had his highlights. Right. I think I usually bet against those players that don't gain separation. I mean, Devontae Parker has made an entire career out of it and he's been fine. Um, making those highlight reel catches with a guy in your face and you're six feet in the air. Um, but I'm going to take the athleticism of Christian Watson. You know, we we saw good things from both, but Christian Watson is a truly rare athlete. He, he, I I think that's something that's lost in the conversations. Is like athleticism isn't everything, but every now and then there is someone that is just kind of different Tyreek Hill in a totally different archetype is that type of a player it's unfair what he has physically it's you know it's not like he's just got the world's greatest hands and is the you know the finest receiver in all the land he's fast as a cheetah there's a reason they call him the cheetah uh and and defenders can't keep up with him but you know with Christian Watson when you're 6'4 and you run a 4'3'6 and your 96th percentile speed and 96, 98th percentile adjusted speed and 95th percentile burst score with a 97th percentile catch radius, like you're you're just kind of a freak of nature. So I'm going to bet on the freak of nature. Moving from second year wide receivers, our final category we're going to talk about is rookie wide receivers. And we brought up a couple players that I think in year one, we're going to lay out the map of here's what could happen, but also beyond like, okay, next year, how valuable is this person going to be in Dynasty? And once again, you can get all of our rankings in the Ultimate Draft Kit Plus for Dynasty startup rankings and rookie drafts. Bets, let's pick a player that I think all of us might collectively poo-poo on. Yeah, you guys went with the fun, exciting first-round rookies, and I decided to go with a third-round NFL draft pick in Josh Downs. <laughs> so too. you could dunk? No, I just think we want to be honest with people. And Josh realistic. Downs sure can't dunk. That's there you go. For sure. At 5'9", are you kidding me? Actually, he probably can. Probably a really good athlete. <laughs> but, but the issue is like we get these rookies every year that we're like, well, like I like the tape, man. I like this. I like that. Well, if these guys don't do it in year one, there is a extremely low likelihood that they ever do it. And that's just across the board. But when they're a third round or later rookie, the hit rate is abysmal for these guys that don't do it in year one. And you can use year one outlook to predict a player's potential value next year. And I see Josh Downs being a guy that's borderline irrelevant, I'm scared to say, because <laughs> there's truthers out there that might come get me, but irrelevant this time next year because, sure, he's 21.8 years old, you know, he's young, 
the the wide receiver room and and Reggie Wayne said he's the best wide receiver in this class. Well, he went in the third round. He's five nine. He's one seventy one. That is a low fantasy ceiling for a player that's only going to play in the slot at the NFL level. You add in he's playing with a rookie quarterback. Those guys don't support elite fantasy options. There's people that are scared for Michael Pittman. If you're scared for Michael Pittman this year, you better be terrified for Josh Downs' outlook as a rookie. And you throw in the mobility for Anthony Richardson, which we love for fantasy, but it will take away production for his pass catchers. And so you add all that together. I have not heard much buzz or hype about him at all this offseason. Josh Downs is a guy that I think people have talked themselves into if there's still rookie drafts going on as like a back end round one, early round two guy. But I just can't get there. And I think this time next year, he's a guy that we kind of forget about pretty quickly. I love that you're bringing his name up because this is a player that I'll be honest is he scared me a little bit because I was very verbally abusive. I would say um, <laughs> before, the, <laughs> be, before the NFL draft, I just, I, I mean, Josh Downs before the NFL draft was just someone that's like he's never going to do anything, and people loved him. Um, th- there was there was plenty of debate on draft Twitter of Zay Flowers versus Josh Downs. Like Josh Downs is way better than Zay Flowers. Josh Downs will surprise; he'll be drafted ahead of Zay Flowers. Blah blah blah. I didn't see that in any way, shape, or form. I don't believe that the NFL didn't see that. Zay Flowers went in the first round. Josh Downs went in the third. But I was I I, I had my fears because I was. I didn't mince words. I was just like, Josh Downs is going to never do anything. He's going to be worthless, yada, yada. I feel better now after the NFL draft going to an Anthony Richardson-led Colts team from a third-round draft selection. Um, and so I'm going to stick to my guns here and say he'll be worthless, and I love that you're bringing it up that he's going to be worthless for, for fantasy purposes. Uh, he could have a long career. Tutu Atwell still, you know, playing football How? for – for the Rams and has an impact on this play or that play but for fantasy football it's just a, it's a it's an irrelevant archetype an irrelevant player in an irrelevant system if you listen back to our pre-draft shows I was a little bit more optimistic also I will admit biased because he's from a part in Georgia where I'm from where he did play basketball Jason I'll try to find a clip of him dunking he played high school basketball I'll bet he can dunk you know what's incredible <laughs> Kyle just somehow managed to work in Drake London Julio Jones and a hometown Josh Downs into the same episode. I, for one, am not shocked. Hey, we're not done yet. I can't wait yeah. to see who's next. Oh, I, I, I do have some stuff when we talk about Michael Gallup, too. Um, uh, so here's what I'll say we can adjust whatever production profile you want to give him in college to landing spot, which is not good with the rookie quarterback. And then I did some work. Betts and I were, were going back and forth about this, but rookies who come in the league as predominantly slot guys, if they don't show it in year one, then they're basically toast. I look back all the way back to 2014 of rookies who saw 50% of their targets in the slot. And the dudes who crushed were the dudes who stayed good, like Jarvis Landry, Cooper Cup, CD Lamb, Jalen Waddle, Amon Ra, and then a long list of players that you forgot ever played in the NFL and should never have even been touched again. So, you know, uh, Kiki Kute, Deshaun Hamilton, uh, Trent Taylor, just a long list. So I think you're going to be able to see in year one with Josh Downs, if he's not commanding targets, if he's not a difference maker, if he's not a, you know, if he's not seeing more than like 75 targets in his rookie year, I think that you're going to be able to quickly say like, okay, I'm going to move on. I'm not saying cut him, but like, he's not going to be a difference maker. So I'm with you. It's really hard for slot wide receivers that are, you know, third round draft capital to be any sort of difference maker. All right, let's have fun and have a different uh, outlook on a rookie wide receiver and what we believe. I'm going to talk about the guy that I absolutely am madly in love with, both pre-NFL draft and even more so post-NFL draft. That's Jordan Addison. He is um, an archetype physically that I don't usually buy into. He is very light. He is small. He is not what I look for in most wide receivers, as seen by my uh, disbelief in Josh Downs. However, Jordan Addison is an elite wide receiver. His route running, the way he sets up defenders, the way he knows where to go, his ball skills, I, I mean, across the board. He's a Bolitnikoff winner. Uh, best wide receiver in all of college football back when he was playing with Kenny Pickett uh, in 2021. He's got experience in the slot. He's got experience out wide from Pitt to USC, respectively. He's just really, really good. 
But now, here's this really, really good wide receiver drafted in the first round. And he goes to a situation where I don't know how it doesn't work for him. You have Justin Jefferson on the other side of the field. You do not matter to a defense. Jordan Addison does not matter to that defense. Justin Jefferson matters to that defense. And if you want to talk about opportunity, CeeDee Lamb last year played 17 games for the pass-happy Kellen Moore-led Dallas Cowboys. CeeDee Lamb ran 571 routes last year. Adam Thielen ran 674 routes, <laughs> 103 more routes than C.D. Lamb, and Adam Thielen is gone, and in comes Jordan Addison into that role. That's what they drafted him to do was replace Adam Thielen. So you're talking about talent. He's got it. Draft capital, he's got it. Will he have the opportunity? Oh, uh, yeah. He's going to be on the field a ton in passing situations a lot, and he's going to succeed there. Uh, Kirk Cousins can get him the ball, so I, uh, I just – you know, I'm very bullish on Jordan Addison. I, I don't think he's the physical archetype of player that is going to be a top eight wide receiver. He's not going to be a super duper star. He's not going to be a fantasy asset that is a first round draft pick. You know, this year we've got a ton. You, you know, we've got Stephon Diggs and Tyreek Hill and Cooper Cup and obviously the the the, the LSU boys up top. Um, I don't think Jordan Addison ever breaks into the first round and becomes that type of a player. But I do think Jordan Addison will have a long six, seven, eight year career of being a, a really valuable fantasy asset, a wide receiver two or better for his entire career. And, uh, you, you know, you can't ask for much more than that. And, you know, we talk about with Josh Downs, how a rookie does in his first year matters so much for his career. And it happens both directions. If you suck your first year, you better have been drafted super high so that you get more opportunity. But if you dominate in your first year and you were drafted high, you're you're just locked into a role forever. And so that's that's what I think Jordan Addison is going to find. Yeah, what's interesting about the way you talked about the LSU boys is like I could see this being the next Jamar Chase T Higgins combo, right? Like it's not a bad thing that he's playing across the field from Justin Jefferson which in theory should have made life easy for Adam Thielen last year. Uh, it did not because of how poor he was efficiency. I mean, those routes were just so empty, man. And he, just to put some numbers to it, he ran the most routes of his career last year at his age. Like that's how much opportunity Crazy. is there for uh, for Jordan Addison. So I like it. The only thing that's I, I want to monitor, because I actually kind of like him for redraft where he goes this year, Jordan Addison, is just he hasn't really practiced at all this offseason season. It's been an undisclosed injury, so let's see what happens in training camp for his early season outlook, but that's not really relevant for Dynasty specifically. Just something to monitor, but I'm with you, man. I'm, I'm very excited for Jordan Addison. I'm very excited for what he can do across the field from Justin Jefferson. Yeah, you, you look at those wide receiver twos, the T. Higgins, the Jalen Waddles, the Devonta Smiths. When you've got a superstar across the field, it opens you up. You're not drafted in the first round, but you're drafted in the second or third round for fantasy, um, and so I, I see that as the, the outlook for Addison. And you've been calling them the the power twos. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I like what? it. The power twos. Is that, that's what you've been calling around the office, right? Uh, I think I've thrown that out before. I don't really have like a tattoo or anything yet. So nothing's trademarked. Got it. No, no, no. No copyrights. Uh, no registered markings at all. Bets. You can put that on your Patreon page, dude. The power twos. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. That, you know. Everyone, <laughs> uh, Jason has him at wide receiver 19, so he's probably a little bit more bullish than some of the other ballers, but I, I'm with you. He's a really fun player. I want to get your opinion. Last guy, Zay Flowers. You two were a bit more bullish than I going into the pre-draft process. Age, size, some of that stuff is hard for me to get over. I can't argue with the draft capital going in the first round to the Baltimore Ravens. I love the offense, and I think all three of us are on board with Todd Monken, whatever he wants to do, pass happy. It's going to be a fun team. What does he have to do in year one, in your mind, to separate? Because right now, in redraft and best ball, all three wide receivers are kind of clumped together. Obviously, there's a massive age gap between OBJ and the rest of them, but what does he need to do in year one for us to say Zay Flowers is a locked in, you know, top 24 type dynasty wide receiver. I found that that's kind of the mark. If after the first year they're in the top 24, they have staying power. If not, 
it's really hard for them to re-enter when they get to year two, three, four in that range. And so now real quick, just just so I have clarity, are you saying that they need to finish in the top twenty four fantasy wise or 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 they need to be in the top twenty four ADP wise, like value wise? Value wise for Dynasty ADP. That's what gotcha. that's what I'm that's what I'm hoping for for Zay Flowers. You have met wide receiver twenty three in our dynasty startup and our consensus wide receiver thirty, which I think is fair. So for him to stay there or doing increase, what do you think statistics wise he either has to finish or what are you looking for to him kind of sustain that, Jason? Yeah, and you know, talking through it this way makes me question my ranking because I, I did like Zay Flowers. I like the film. I do love the draft capital. I love that he's going to the Ravens, that they need a wide receiver, and they've got, you know, a locked in uh quarterback. And so th this this is why I had him at wide receiver 23 in my startup rankings and I'm a believer but as you speak and I'm realizing I know I know exactly what has to happen for him to be a top 24 drafted wide receiver next year he has to be the wide receiver one for the Baltimore Ravens that's the answer it's not a matter of what is his stat line have to be it's just got to be okay yeah he's Lamar Jackson's number one guy and that gets a little scary because yeah. Bateman could easily be the number one guy. They are paying Odell Beckham a just a, way too much money for what Odell Beckham is right now. Odell Beckham is paid so much that he's almost guaranteed to be the wide receiver two here. It's like, you know, in, in two wide receiver sets, uh, they're not bringing Odell Beckham off the field. So is it Zay Flowers or is it Rashad Bateman? And that becomes a really... 50 50 proposition maybe even a 55 45 in favor of Bateman if he's healthy um as to who wins that so I'm starting to think maybe my wide receiver ranking of him currently startup wise as the wide receiver 23 might be a scooch too high for Zay Flowers um if we're just looking at probability of where he'll finish uh value wise next year I, I think that there's good odds he is not viewed as the wide receiver one for the Ravens at the end of the season. This is one of my favorite parts of getting to look at fantasy football is like what Jason just did is looking at a player from about five different lenses of, I like the talent of this player. I like the draft capital. I'm looking at the situation. I'm looking at dynasty value. I'm looking at redraft and best ball where he's going. And you're kind of mixing all of those together to see that there is a range of outcomes for any single player. So I agree with you. I was looking back at just comps that I had in our pre-draft process. It's like smaller wide receiver who is shifty, can have big plays, but they also could kind of use him in, in creative ways. Like I've, he's gotten the mini Debo comps. He's not nearly as big um, or as bruising, but like that's a, just, that's a weird comp to me, man. I, I mini, mini Debo. Yeah. I just don't, it's like, I, I don't see it at all. He just doesn't play how he plays. And <laughs> Debo is like the big physical dominant, I'm going to beat you up and run you over type of player. I don't understand that comp at all. But anyways, continue. He He's tough. I'll give – Zay Flowers is a tough receiver, and he's going to be used more – he's going to be used on short eight-out stuff a lot, not just deep. So looking at, you know, just players like if he got 18 to 20% of the targets this year and he kind of hits some of those elite – metrics that we look for like around you know two yards per route run something like that then I think that you're building on a player who we're saying can be the number one but it's just such a gray area when you look at those three wide receivers and so I've I've had a hard time in dynasty being bullish on him and just kind of saying like I'm I'm just gonna have to wait and see what this offense is gonna do where Bateman's obviously way cheaper like you're gonna be able to get Bateman a lot cheaper than you do Zay Flowers right now if you want part of that offense so Betts do you have any take on Flowers? Yeah, I think just speaking to the Ravens as a whole, like, and I feel like in redraft, everyone's paying a tax on Ravens guys this year. It's like, well, we all know they want to be throwing more and we want to take our shots, but we've talked about Zay Flowers and the Ravens for the last five minutes. I don't think anyone has mentioned Mark Andrews' name. So these guys are out there running as the wide receiver two, three, and four because Mark Andrews is the wide receiver one, and I don't see that changing. And so when you consider that plus... Like Lamar, yeah, they're going to drop back more, but that might lead to more scrambling opportunities. I'm not sure. I mean, Lamar Jackson's arguably the best running quarterback in the NFL, maybe Justin Fields, if you want to have that debate. But that's going to take away production. So I think someone of this group loses out this year. I don't know who it is. 
but Odell's age curve has not been great. And so what I think you need to see from Zay Flowers is maybe he gets off to a slow start, but I do think he has to emerge over Odell Beckham because if he doesn't, that's a little scary. And I certainly think he has to start to eat into Rashad Bateman's role towards the back half of the year for you to feel like Zay Flowers can be the dude behind Mark Andrews because to me that's a huge piece of this puzzle and I know we all love the Ravens and we want that but like I said I think one of these wide receivers is going to lose out imagine not liking the Ravens this year imagine just not being on board (laughs) I can't just being a complete hater and thinking that they're worthless that's impossible and that's why we don't let Andy you know sometimes on the show is just Mm -hmm. his Ravens uh, speech is just it's just not not very good if you want to get all those rankings, once again, Ultimate Draft Kit Plus, every single player or startup rankings that you can customize to your league, and our new draft analyzer just came out. But time for one more segment. Take it or leave it. So we're going to give a parting thought of a wide receiver that's past 50 in our startup rankings. So this is way down there. And just wanted to kind of leave you with a thought. Maybe it's somebody that you could put an offer in, maybe get a little bit curious about. But Jason, I will let you go first. Who is your take it or leave it for today? Yeah, I think he costs nothing. I think he's been uh, left on the side of the road like roadkill. And I believe he's got a couple years of relevance left for fantasy. It's Michael Gallup. He is a young 27 years old. He is now two years removed from the injury that that cost him. And, And Betts, you've done so many studies and tried to bang the drum of Look, it's not the year for most, for average NFL players, uh, not the super young hyper athletes like Jamal Charles' first ACL, but for most players in their NFL career, their first year back from ACL, they're back, but they're not back to full strength. And their second year, they get better. They get more efficient. They get more productive. Well, that's what it is for Michael Gallup. He's two years removed from that. He's still only 27 years old, and he signed through 2026. It would be $20 million in dead cap just in 2024 if they wanted to get out. Brandon Cooks, they can get out of significantly cheaper after this year. So uh, I I think that it's one of those deals where Michael Gallup is here for several years on a solid offense as a wide receiver two or three who will have fantasy production who costs nothing. I mean, nobody – Michael Gallup is a throw-in piece on a different trade that nobody is caring about. But this is a player you're going to be able to put in your flex – I think he's going to be better this year than he was last year, despite the addition of Brandon Cooks. And, um, he, you know, he he's paid a lot of money. He's not going anywhere. Um, so for where he is in, you know, because he's, he's buried. For where he is in startup rankings, I think he's better than most of the guys around him. I'll throw out that he is my highest exposure wide receiver in best ball this year. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, he's cheap. He's cheap for this year. And a cheap beyond. And then my Georgia fact is he's from Monroe, Monroe, Georgia. Which Thank is you. that how you say it? Yeah. Thank you, Ka. Monroe. Well, that's how you say it if you're from there. Okay, that's more of a like. How do you how do you say it if you're not thing. from there? Monroe, <laughs> Monroe. But you're Monroe. That's yeah. like uh, we've got we've got Prescott. If you're from here, otherwise, if you're not, it's Prescott. <laughs> which is how I would Bet- say, hundred percent. Bets hit us with another name. Hey, you want to talk about someone who has kind of been left for dead uh, and might be valued less than Michael Gallup is Nico Collins, who he's kind of getting a little bit of offseason hype, which makes me worried about this right now. But he's 24 years old. We've got him as like our wide receiver 64 in rankings. So in theory, you could throw a third round pick and, and maybe get Nico Collins or uh, like, like Jason said, a throw in piece to another trade. But I at least like that from year one to year two in the NFL, he showed some growth in terms of his efficiency, going from about 32 yards per game to 48, 1.24 yards per route run up to 1.7, 16% uh, targets per route run up to 22.4. So looking at those numbers, it's like, well, maybe there's some talent here. We're not really sure. And when you look at the quarterback play, granted, rookie quarterbacks, we know the story there. We've said it multiple times on the show, but it was Davis Mills, Kyle Allen, and Tyrod Taylor is kind of who he's been catching passes from. So if CJ Stroud can develop into an average to above average quarterback in the NFL. Kyle was big on CJ Stroud in the pre-draft process. I think Nico Collins could give you some flex weeks, not only this year, but potentially moving forward. So looking at the depth chart too, like, yeah, John Mechie, I'm I'm super excited he's back on NFL field. We just don't know 
if he is talented enough to succeed in the NFL. He's 5'11". Robert Woods is six foot. Uh, he's clearly on the back nine of his career. And Tank Dell is 5'8 and like 165 pounds soaking wet. So they don't have another guy like Nico Collins on the roster. The one thing that makes me worried, though, is that he was not selected by this regime. So I'm a little worried that it maybe doesn't fit. But just the target, you know, per out run stuff and the efficiency kind of has me intrigued about Nico Collins this year. I don't mind it at all. He's just sitting on a dynasty bench of mine. Hope, hopefully he's something. And I'll quickly throw out Isaiah Hodgin. Yep, plays for the Giants. 24.7 years old, but he was a Brian Dable guy in Buffalo that claimed him off waivers in November. And then the dude was just on the field. He had a six-week stretch where he was pretty relevant for them. From week 12 on, he averaged 11 fantasy points per game, six targets, four finishes inside the top 20. And then the playoffs, I, for, I totally forgot that against Minnesota, he went eight for 105 and one, and he ran a season high 41% of his routes from the slot. And the whole team airballed against Betts' Eagles after that. But is he the starting outside wide receiver for the Giants? I think so. And they have a bunch of other slot guys. They have no money contractually obligated to him beyond this year. He's his exclusive rights free agent. But he's an interesting name because how much Dable likes him. That I think it wouldn't surprise me if they bring him back after this year and he keeps being the outside guy. So super cheap, the end of your bench, but I had forgot how involved he was down the stretch and he's going to be a starting wide receiver in the NFL, which is rare to be able to find off the scrap heap, which is where everybody found him last year. That's going to do it for this episode, our dynasty rankings. If you want to get everything, go to ultimatedraftkit.com. Hope everybody has a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast. If you want to take your dynasty skills to the next level, check out the fantasyfootballers.com.